Hi everyone, it's Kaylee from RoboFlow and I am joined today by our CTO, Brad Dwyer. So Brad, um, to kick things off, I want to talk about deployment in RoboFlow. What are the different ways that you can deploy your model after you've trained it inside RoboFlow? Yeah, so this is an area that we have been working really hard on to expand the number of use cases that we can support with RoboFlow Train and RoboFlow Deploy, which are our deployment considerations within the product. Um, so right now, the different ways that you can deploy, um, the most common way that people use is called the inference server. Um, so this is something that we've set up that lives in the cloud, it's cloud native, and it's an auto-scaling prediction service. So essentially, you train your model and we get these uh, trained weights that are really good at matching the input data that you trained it on and giving you predictions in the wild. So you can imagine uh, you trained on a whole bunch of Google Maps images and you're trying to find let's say mailboxes, um, and you fed in a thousand mailbox images uh, labeled with where the box, where the mailbox is on the satellite photos. And now you wanna actually use that model to, um, let's say, find all of the mailboxes in the United States. And you're gonna upload a hundred million images from Google Maps or some other satellite provider. Um, the inference server is really, really good at things like that. Uh, and in fact, we can auto scale up when you're using it, um, essentially to infinity servers. Um, and you don't really have to worry about the DevOps of managing a fleet of servers or you know, making sure that they're all running the same model or building the infrastructure around those weights to you know, parse image data mm -hmm. and feed it through a model and get stuff back. Um, so for most use cases, um, the infra server is the way to go. It's just a, a custom API that we give you where you feed in an image, and that can either be the binary image data or a URL to uh, an image hosted on the web somewhere. And it runs through your model and returns back a prediction. It's kind of like a magical API that, awesome. that just works. Um, and so really the question should be like, not when should I use the inference server, but when shouldn't I use the inference mm -hmm. server? Um, I think for most people, the default should be like, I should use the, the cloud hosted inference server um, unless there is a reason, you know, why why my particular problem is not a good fit for that. And what would be a good example of a problem that's not a good fit for that? And how do we RoboFlow um, accommodate those unique needs? Sure. Um, so there's a few different reasons why, or, or like types of problem where the inference server wouldn't work very well. Um, the first one is like if you don't have an internet connection. Um, so because the inference server lives in the cloud. Um, you really you have to go through the internet to send your photo to it and get your predictions back. So an example of that might be um, you're having an autonomous airplane that's flying over the Atlantic Ocean, right? And until Elon gets his satellites working <laughs> and your your plane your autonomous plane can have a satellite dish that's connected you know to the internet via satellite, um, you're probably going to have to put your model on that device. Um, and so in, in use cases like that, um, we have what we call on-device deployment. And there's a whole bunch of different um, ways that you can do on-device deployment. But essentially what it is, is you have a computer that is um, on the device that you are deploying to that's actually doing the computations to give you the predictions. Um, and we're adding more and more of those all the time uh, to support different ecosystems and different use cases. Yeah. Um, the two that we support right now are the NVIDIA Jetson line of devices, which is um, NVIDIA's um, edge computing devices, and it kind of spans the gamut all the way from the Nano, which is a sub $100 device, um, all the way up to like the Xavier NX, which is I think uh, six or $700. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's everything in between, and you, know, you can go from, I need X number of predictions per second, I think uh, you know, two to five on the low end, to all the way up to 20 or 30 per second on the high end. Um, and then you can chain those together if you need more than that. Um, so that's, that's the one side of things. Um, the other reason why you might um, not be able to use the inference server is um, if maybe you have an internet connection available, but you don't wanna use it for, for some reason. Like maybe you're out in a farm field and you're trying to like drive a tractor in autonomously. You might have the internet connection, but if your internet cuts out or you know gets slow, um, you know you don't want your tractor to be like 
running over people or like leaving the field. Sure. Um, and so for, for some situations, like you wouldn't want your self-driving car to be powered by a remote server. <laughs> um, it just isn't a good dependency to add. Um, the other use cases that we've seen um, uptake on the on-device deploy um, fall into two categories. The one is like the super privacy privacy sensitive ones. So you can imagine if you're um, you know, a government organization like the CIA or something like that and you're looking at classified information, it might be um, illegal for you to be uploading that to a third party API. Mm -hmm. You really have to you know, control um, that data very and protect it. Um, and so you might want to or need to um, kind of like isolate that into an environment that you can control. Um, and we've, we've found people are oftentimes able to find data that they can train a model on um, pretty effectively. Um, you know, they can pre-vet it to make sure that there's not sensitive information in the data that they train on. Um, but then when they're getting predictions, it's a lot more of the wild west, right? Like if you're um, dealing with patient healthcare data, you can make sure that you don't upload anything with somebody's you know, social security number or medical information when you're training. Um, but you can't really control what a doctor does with their iPhone and your app. Like they might accidentally point it at something that, you know, even if the, the purpose of the app isn't to deal with that sort of sensitive information, you can't rule out that it might make its way through. And so for those types of situations, you might deal with um, an on-device deploy. Um, and that leads me uh, pretty well to the other type of on-device deploy. So we mentioned like those NVIDIA Jetsons. Uh, I don't think I mentioned um, the Oak device, mm -hmm. which is another one that we support. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, we're coming out with support for more and more different devices. So by the time the studio comes out, there might be even more that we support. Um, but the other main type of deployment option that we have, um, we call it uh, in-browser inference. So this is a way to um, shift the compute cost from you and your organization to your customer and their device. Um, and so this runs in a customer's web browser, the end user's web browser, whether that be on their computer, um, like in Google Chrome, for instance, or on their cell phone. So you could run it in mobile Safari or embed this in a native mobile application. Um, and so you can imagine if you have, let's say like an app that has 100,000 monthly active users that are using your app um, pretty often, um, it might not make sense for your business model for you to be paying for all of the computation power for all of those users. Mm -hmm. And so by um, deploying your model to the edge in the web browser um, and, and letting your, your customer's iPhone or laptop be the one that's making the predictions, um, you can shift that compute burden out to the edge, um, which lets you really scale in a cost-effective manner. The fun thing about that third one is you can actually see it for yourself inside your RoboFlow account. Um, you can run the inference right there from your own webcam and actually like see the model performing in real time. Yeah, I think uh, my favorite demo of that uh, is the the mask no mask detector because nowadays you know most people just kind of have one available to try it out and it's just like uh, a magical experience to have. Uh, a live video feed that all of a sudden is contextually aware of what's around it and you can just like really see like if I hold the mask up to my face it detects it as a mask if I if I hold it down it just detects that I'm not wearing a mask and uh, I think that especially for non-technical people where sometimes the phrase computer vision they're hearing it for the first time yeah. it can be hard to like describe abstractly what it means mm -hmm. um, but you know showing them uh, a mask no mask detector or their iPhone scanning like their credit card number so they don't have to type it in or you know a ATM reading a check right like those yeah. are like things that normal everyday people can understand and they probably even used without knowing it mm -hmm. uh, and so these these web browser based things are really cool because uh, you know you don't have to download any software you don't have to like set up a server you don't have to do any of those things you can just click a button and you can send a link to a friend and they can try the thing that you've built absolutely um, as we wrap up today, I'm curious if you can share with us any additional or final considerations that you think should be taken into account when any of our users is considering how they want to deploy their trained model. So I think uh, the one consideration that we didn't describe is if uh, latency is super important. Um, and so there's a difference between throughput and latency, um, meaning that um, Throughput is the number of images per second that you can do. Um, so you can imagine, like, if I um, 
have, I'm using the inference API and the, the server is halfway across the globe. Um, I can send 50 images at a time and those images can go out and, and go to 50 different servers but they're all halfway around the, the globe and they might come back to me one second later. So the throughput is 50 images per second, mm -hmm. but the frame rate, like the fastest that I can sequentially like get a new frame, send it across the globe, have it do a prediction and send it back is still only one second. And so it's kind of like that phrase where like, um, when you're describing uh, the effects of parallelization, um, you know, nine women can have nine babies in nine months, but, uh, or sorry, what, uh, things don't scale literally right? nine, nine women can't have a baby in one month right. um, and but they can have nine babies in nine months and so you can kind of think of inference in that same sort of way if you need to um, have a video feed that responds very very quickly um, having that prediction done as close as you can get it to the camera is really important and so you can imagine a situation where like um, you have uh, I'm just making this up on the fly, but maybe you have like a basketball hoop and you have like a Shaquille O'Neal bot that's just gonna like reject everybody that's trying to shoot basketballs. Um, if the time between the camera seeing the basketball coming towards the hoop and it being able to swat it down is a second, you know, it's gonna miss that basketball every time. No, no matter if, you know, you can like cue that up and get back an entire video of an hour of basketball shooting mm -hmm. in a second, that doesn't do you any good. You really need to respond very quickly. Um, and so that, that's the other consideration is the latency time. Um, but for most cases, that's really not um, a very important consideration. Self-driving cars would be another one where it is important. If a kid runs out into the street, it doesn't do you any good to know that a second later, you really want to hit the brakes as quickly as possible. Wonderful. Thank you for this. This is so fascinating. Um, if any of you have questions about how to deploy your model, please reach out to us. We're always happy to learn about your project and help you choose the best method for you, depending on how quickly you need to run inference and uh, where and, and how you'll be actually deploying that model in the field. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you so much for tuning in. Happy training. <laughs>